Ave Maria, and welcome to Divine Poetry, a series that explores the chronological parallels between the history of the Catholic Church and the Old Testament. If you're new to this concept, go back and watch my interview with Kevin Davis. The link is in the video description below. To make things more simple, I have divided up church history and the Old Testament into eight color-coded time periods. Below you can see a scrolling bar with the names, dates, and the Old Testament books for each period. Use this timeline to guide you in each video. The color frame of each video will match the time period that we're discussing. Now, let's start today's episode. Hello, and welcome to episode 26 of Divine Poetry. Today's episode, I'll talk about the two witnesses, and this is part of an ongoing series of prior videos where we have been discussing the books of the, the book of the Apocalypse, the book of Daniel, biblical prophecy, and how all of that can be viewed in a unique, I guess, or a special way, one might say, through the parallels that exist between the history of the Catholic Church and the Old Testament. Um, so let me announce, first of all, that um, I got an email from a, from a friend and a viewer of, these, of the series, and they suggested that since uh, I've had my book out for a couple weeks now, and my, my first book, Divine Poetry, and my second book, Vatican II and Antichrist, that I could offer a Q&A session, a question and answer session, um, because um, she, she had some questions about the book, and I'm, I imagine maybe some of you might have some questions as well. So if you want to email me the questions, um, I would appreciate that. Don't put them in the comment section, because I, I won't check that all the time. But if you email me uh, the questions, then next week's video, I will address them um, one by one. So you can email me at my new email address. I have, I have multiple now, so you can just pick which one. But um, divinepoetry at fide.email, you can email me there, or my old email addresses as well, which is um, gloriousheritage777 at gmail.com, or if you have any other email addresses that you know of that reach me, that's fine. I check them all every day. <laughs> so again, a Q&A session. So just email me your questions about the book or about divine poetry or about the parallels or about prophecies of Daniel and Apocalypse, and I'll kind of give you my take on them as I've presented them in the books. Great. Um, so today, I guess uh, the two witnesses, I'm going to start off um, in a roundabout way, and I'll, I'll, explain, I'll explain after I present this, I'll explain why it's relevant. But first, let me present it to you. Um, it is a parallel between the Gospels and... Uh, church history. Now, um, just to break this down, some of you who might be new viewers or maybe have been swimming in all the information that I that I just kind of you know pour out <laughs> in these videos, um, the, the Catholic Church's history uh, seems to be, in my mind, it's a sol it's a solid solid lock, but it seems to be chronologically prefigured by the Old Testament. So that as the Old Testament progresses, so does church history, and they 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 go up right to our present day. We're still having parallels with. Um, the Old Testament. And I, I've explained that in prior videos. But also, um, it also seems that the Gospels share in this uh, phenomenon as well. So that all three of them, the Gospels as one, one unit from start to finish, parallel in chronological order, church history, and the Old Testament. So today I'm going to present uh, some parallels between the Catholic Restoration and the Council of Trent in church history and the Gospel account of the Transfiguration of Christ in the Gospels. Uh, and that this is going to become relevant in my um, uh, explanation of the two witnesses in a minute, but I'm just going to set this kind of like abstract foundation first. Okay, um, I, I also need to point out that if you do progress through the Gospels and church history, um, these two points, the, the points of the Catholic Restoration uh, in the Council of Trent and in church history and in, in the Gospels of Transfiguration, they do line up chronologically. Um, so, you know, very first thing to note is that we are in the... the um, the, the time periods are chronologically aligned, right? And that helps because then when you see the, um, the parallels themselves, it gives it more context. And I also would like to point out, this is kind of obvious, I've kind of beaten a dead horse here, but that, that events further on in the Gospels, parallel events further on in church history, up until we could see the crucifixion of Christ in the Gospels as parallel with Vatican II. And I've already done videos on this. I have pamphlets on this. It's part of my book, Divi um, Vatican II and Antichrist. So I hopefully I've established that, at least um, to those who care to look. Um, okay, first let me start by reading the account from the Gospel of St. Matthew about the Transfiguration. And I know we all know this, but it's little details in the account that are important. So we all have the story in our heads, but I just want to draw attention to certain words and concepts in the account. 
Okay, um, after six days, Jesus taketh unto him Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart. And he was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his garments became white as snow. And behold, there appeared to him to them Moses and Elias talking with him. And Peter answering said to Jesus, Lord, it, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. And as he was speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and lo, a voice out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And the disciples, hearing, fell upon their face, and were very much afraid. And Jesus came and touched them, and said to them, Arise, and fear not. And they, lifting up their, eye, their eyes, saw no one but Jesus. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man, till the Son of Man be risen from the dead. Okay, so there's the account. Um, now let me go to um, church history, and we're going to talk about the Catholic Restoration, um, um, or you can say the, uh, the Catholic, the Catholic Ref Reformation, um, and that would be the, the period after the Protestant Revolt, when, um, well, okay, I'll, get, I'll get into it. So to set the stage for this, we all know that um, in prior church, well, the Catholic, first of all, the Catholic Restoration or Re Reformation of the Catholic Church happened in the mid-1500s. That's when it started. Um, prior to that, you know, centuries before, we had a lot of drama focused on the papacy. Um, first, we had the Avignon Papacy, and that's when King uh, Philippe le Bel, uh, uh, Philip IV of France, Philip the Fair, he pressured the, the Pope to um, reside in Avignon, France, and um, and the, the papacy resided there for about 70 years. People have called it the, um, cap the, Babylon the Babylonian captivity of the papacy because it was 70 years away from Rome. Um, following the Avignon Papacy was the Papal Schism. And that's, of course, when we had um, two papal claimants, one in Avignon and one in Rome. And that lasted for, I think it was like 50 or 60 years or 70 years. It lasted for a long time. Um, and that, I think that ended in the, in the early 1400s, um, if I remember right. I could be wrong. It might be the late 1400s. I apologize. I think it's the early 1400s. So in the minds of Catholics for a century and a half to maybe two centuries about, um, the concept, the idea of the papacy was kind of degraded a little bit in their minds because of all of the confusion and, and um, I don't want to say, I guess scandal would be a word appropriate. I don't want to say the papacy is scandalous. It's not, but you, you know what I'm trying to say. Um, so then this gives fertile ground for Luther's revolt. Um, the people of the Catholics of Christendom were somewhat disillusioned with the, uh, with the clergy, um, with the, the Renaissance uh, was in full swing at this time. Um, in, in, the, in the mid parts of the 1400s, and opulence and high living luxury were, were um, unfortunately prominent among much of the, the clergy, especially in Rome. Uh, coupled with the two or one and a half centuries of, of uh, confusion from the Avignon Papacy and the uh, Papal Schism, um, gave fertile ground for Catholics to consider Martin Luther's heresies. Um, and then, of course, the tragedy of the Protestant Revolt uh, occurred, and Northern Europe, most of Northern Europe, went into apostasy and heresy. And that sets the stage for the Catholic Reformation. So the Council of Trent is called. Now the um, the Council of Trent takes place high up in or up in the Alps in, in what is currently um, uh, present day Italy in the Alps, which is the, the Italian section of the Alps. Of course, it takes place in the, in the city of Trent. Um, though there were political situations present at the time that prevented or dissuaded many bishops from Christendom from attending. And what happened was only the um, the closest bishops, both in proximity to geography and in terms of allegiance to the, or what's the word, um, closeness to the papacy, uh, like the Italian bishops, the ones who were more inter intricately connected with the Holy See, like their cousins were part of the Curia, or they had other connections. Um, those are the bishops that ended up mostly attending the Council of Trent. There were not very many bishops at the Council of Trent. So consider in the uh, gospel account of um, the Transfiguration, our Lord took his three closest inner circle of, of apostles, uh, St. Peter, St. James, and St. John, up into the mountain. And here you have the closest bishops of the Pope um, going up into the mountains as well. So uh, right from the bat, we have a set of parallels here. Um, Mount Tabor was the scene of the Transfiguration, and um, that's north of, of Jerusalem. And now you have north of Rome in the Alps is where the Council of Trent takes place. All right. Um, the, the point of the Council of Trent was to create a bulwark against Protestantism, and they did so by focusing on the doctrines of the faith and the liturgy. Um, and, uh, the Council of Trent, um, but the, the Catholic Reformation in, in more of a general sense focused on the liturgy and the faith. Um, before 
the Council of Trent, the catechisms were, um, if there were any catechisms, they were old and um, they were not very um, polished, one could say. Um, but the Council of Trent issued a series of anathemas and clarifications about the doctrines of the faith, very clear, very radiant teachings. Um, and also, of course, we know that later on, the Count, the um, Pope St. Pius V codified the Tridentine Mass. This is all part of the Cal Council of, um, or the Catholic Reformation. So you have, in, in, in a metaphorical sense, you could see that as Christ was, was made radiant and, and, um, and transfigured on the mount, so too was the faith and the liturgy also, in a, in a, in a very metaphorical sense, also made more radiant and clear and, and, and translucent, one might say, during the Catholic Reformation. Um, so that um, are some neat parallels there. Now, our Lord's gown became white as snow. Um, and so when you go to the uh, Catholic Reformation, you have Pope St. Pius V, who was a Dominican first, uh, and he was very, um, he loved his, his, his um, Dominican um, habit, and he loved his Dominican identity, and he brought that into the papacy. So the Dominicans, of course, wear a, a, a white garment, and then they put a black one over top of that. So Pope St. Pius V is credited with starting the tradition of popes wearing all white. Now, they don't wear white all the time, but the iconic idea of, you can see pictures of Pope St. Pius, or Pope Pius XI and XII, Pope St. Pius X, they have photographs where they're all in white. Not all the time, but sometimes. That, they I've read, is credited back to Pope St. Pius V, who his garments are made all white. So here you have our Lord's garments made white as snow, and this is the time in church history when the papal garments are, are also made white as, white as snow, which is, which is so cool. Now, um, St. Peter says in the accounts of the um, Transfiguration that he wants to build tabernacles there so, uh, so that he could, so that, that um, our Lord and, and Elias and Moses can dwell there. Um, a tabernacle or a tent is meant for a, a dwelling place. It's meant to keep, um, like, you know, it's, it's said many times that God's going to dwell with his people, right? So he dwells in the temple. The idea would be that he's close to his people and they, they can see his dwelling place and it, it comforts them. They know that God is right there. So St. Peter, in a way, was saying, I want this moment to continue. I want, I want the dwelling of the prophets and our Lord to, to remain here. Now, in church history... I, I didn't know this, but I, I, I assume it's correct. I, I was reading it that um, the, the idea or the, um, the placement of the tabernacle on the Catholic altar, uh, which is now a universal thing in, in, in a true Catholic church, the tabernacle um, is center, front and center, and we have God dwelling with us. We can see it. It's, it's right there, center stage. Stage is the wrong center, center of our vision. Um, that started... Um, as a universal uh, idea and, and manda mandated um, concept, it started after um, Luther and during the, Pro the Catholic Reformation. Uh, it started in Italy first, and then it spread throughout the universal church. Now, before that, there was no, I guess, no universal way where the tabernacle had to be located. Um, I, I've heard that in some Nordic countries, they had a, a tower, some kind of like stone tower, and the tabernacle was um, reserved on top of that as a, as a safety precaution, but also probably as a form of tradition after a while. And in similar churches, I mean, I'm not saying the tabernacles were off in no man's land like Novus Ordo did, but they weren't um, front and center um, on a Catholic altar until the Catholic Reformation. So here you have St. Peter wanting to build tabernacles, um, and then you have the tabernacle being moved, prominently placed on altars in the Catholic Reformation. Okay, now here's the point, here's the parallels that I'm going to, that are the one I want to stress and dwell upon, is um, Moses and Elias. So as we know that Moses and Elias both appeared um, with our Lord and they were talking together and they were also radiant and, um, and, and um, shining, I guess you could say. Um, I, I assume. Um, I, don't think, did I, I don't remember if, if the text specifically said that. But um, during church history in the, in the Catholic Reformation, we have these two concepts that, that I just mentioned that are also made radiant. And that's, again, again the faith and the liturgy. And I want to hold on to that idea because we're, we're going to come back to that in a minute we talk about the two witnesses. Okay, so I just want to keep that in place because it just shows, what, what I want to show is continuity of concept between um, the two witnesses and the concepts of faith and liturgy. Now, I'm going to read now from the Catholic Haydock uh, Bible commentary about Apocalypse 11, which is the, the text of the two witnesses. And what, what I want to establish here is that even though it's widely accepted that the two witnesses will actually actually be Elias and Enoch, or Enoch and Elias. I'm going to show that some of the saints did not necessarily think so. All right, so I'm just going to read that. Um, again, this is from the Catholic Haydock Bible Commentary. This opinion, at least to Elias, is grounded on those words of the prophet Malachi, or Mal Malachias, 
Behold, I will send you Elias the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And also in the words of our Savior Christ, um, where he tells his disciples, Elias indeed shall come and restore all things. But I cannot say that the consent of the fathers is so unanimous as to Enoch. For we find St. Hilary that some thought, as I'm sorry, for we find by St. Hilary that some thought Jeremiah would come with Elias, and he himself thought that with Elias should come Moses. So the idea here is that um, um, a lot of the church fathers thought that Elias was going to be one of the two witnesses, but the other one could be Moses or could be uh, Jeremiah or maybe one of the other prophets. But it's Moses, which is interesting because here you have the Mo- Moses Elias combo as the two witnesses, but that's who appeared with our Lord on Mount Tabor, Moses and Elias. All right. Now hold on to that thought. Now we're going to go, um, let's see here. What, what am I going to go to next? Um, okay. So I should probably now at this point read to you the actual text of the two witnesses because that's also important as well. I, I know there's a lot of strands here I'm keeping open, but I'm going to weave them together at the end. So I am going somewhere with all this. All right. And, and I will give unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy, or prophesy for, for a thousand two hundred and sixty days clothed in sackcloth. They are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks and stand, that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire shall come out of their mouths and shall devour their enemies. If any man will hurt them, in this manner must he be slain. They have power to shut heaven, that is, um, reign not in the days of their prophecy. And then... And they have power over waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the abyss shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their bodies shall lie in the streets of the great city, which is called spiritually Sodom and Egypt, where their Lord also is crucified. And they of the tribes and peoples and tongues and nations shall see their bodies for three and a half, for three days and a half, and they shall not suffer their bodies to be laid in sepulchres. And they shall, and they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt upon the earth. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them that saw them. Okay, so some points here that um, I want to make real quick. Well, actually, no, I'm, uh, at this point now, I'm going to switch gears again, and I'm going to read a little bit from... My book, Vatican II and Antichrist. And by the way, you can find this on GloriousHeritageBooks.com. Um, for anyone who's not aware, this book um, goes through the prophecies of Daniel and the book of the Apocalypse and shows their fulfillments in the, um, the events of Vatican II. And it makes the case that the actual reign of Antichrist is not, none other than Vatican II. I'll just leave it at that. Um, all right, now I'm going to read a portion of this book from the, two, from the chapter about the two witnesses. All right, where am I going to start here? Okay, so these are the points um, from the text I just read that I'm going to um, uh, uh, explain a little bit. Okay, so first of all, they are, they, they are I'm, re- I'm reading from my text now. They are two witnesses acting together as one unit. They prophesize for 1,260 days. They are killed by the beast after, they prof- after they're done with their prophecy. They will not be suffered to be buried, and they will lay in the streets of the great city. They that dwell upon the earth rejoice at their death, giving gifts to each other. After three and three and a half days, they come back to life, and great fear falls upon those that see them alive again. So, uh, killed by the beast from the abyss. It's important to note that, that the two witnesses prophesied for 1,260 days before they were killed by the beast from the abyss. If you recall, that time period is the same as 42 months and three and a half years. And here's a conversion chart to show you. So, excuse me. So the idea is that. Um, the time that they prophesied for, which is 1,260 days, is actually the same as 42 months, and I'll get into that in a second why that's important, but also the same as three and a half times. They're all the same unit, they're all the same amount of time described in different units of time. So, okay, this time period and structure immediately brings to mind the time periods and structure inherent in the prophecy of the 70 weeks from Daniel, chapter 9, and the prophecy of the seven headed beast out of the sea. Okay, if you recall, in the prophecy of the 70 weeks, the abomination of desolation appears at the midpoint of the final week. A week is a period of seven, and a half of that is three and a half. Okay, so that's one point. The seven headed beast out of the sea makes war with the saints and overcomes them. And this is from Apocalypse 13 or 17. The beast is given power for 42 months. 42 months is the same as, as three and a half times. All right, um, now um, I'm going to skip that part here for a second. 
Uh, okay, I'm going to read one more part here. Um, to further underscore this point, consider the similar, similar language used in both the text about the, the beast overcoming the saints and the beast overcoming the two witnesses. So uh, in chapter 13, it says, um, And it was given unto him, the beast, to make war with the saints and overcome them. In the text of the two witnesses, it says also, And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the abyss shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. So you see this, the very similar language. So if the Novus Ordo is the event that um, that both overcome the saints and kill the two witnesses, then who are the two witnesses? And what I mean by that is that um, you can see, uh, this is one, one of my prior videos, but there's an overlap between the final week of the book of Daniel and the seven-headed beast out of the sea. And you can get to that by, by that time period in the final week. So going back, this is all complex, but going back to the, um, the idea of the final week in the book of Daniel, chapter 9, you see that um, the abomination is placed in the, on the altar in the holy place at the midpoint of the final week. Now, that final week is identified as the um, 84 years between February 11th, 1929, the signing of the Lateran Treaty, and February 11th, 2013, Benedict resigns. There's a clean in the 84 years, and the Novus Ordo, Paul VI mandates the Novus Ordo in 1971, which is 42 years from each. Now, in the seven-headed beast out of the sea text, we, we are told that um, the beast uh, makes war with the saints and has power for 42 months. So 42 months is the same as three and a half, right? So um, we're also told that the seven-headed beast, the seven heads represent seven kings. If you go to that time period that I just mentioned, there are seven priest kings of Vatican City. It starts with Pope Pius XI and ends with Benedict XIII, seven priest kings. Now, five are anti-popes, but they're all priest kings. And so that what I'm trying to show is that this, the period of the beast out of the sea is the same period as the final week of Daniel. And the, the, um, the fact that the Novus Ordo is placed in the holy place in the midpoint of that final week makes me wonder, I guess is a good word to say, is to say that, that the reason why the beast has power over the saints in the book of the apocalypse is because of the Novus Ordo. It's the Novus Ordo that is described in all these prophecies, okay? So therefore, when you go to the text of the, of the two witnesses and how they prophesize for 1,260 days or three and a half times, and then they're killed by the beast, it's showing that the beast, that action, that, that action that does, that does everything is the same concept. It's the Novus Ordo. So what kills the two witnesses is the Novus Ordo because it's the same time periods. Okay, I'm trying to get all this out. I think I think I got it here. Um, I'm going way over, way over my time, but this is a complicated topic. So um, so we're gonna kind of run with it. I think I covered all these things. I did. All right, good. All right. So let's get into the identity of the two witnesses and a little bit more of showing how that the um, the events of the Novus Ordo are congruent with um, the prophecy of the two, two witnesses. So I'm going to cover these things next. All right. First, I'm going to establish um, the idea that um, even though uh, it's widely accepted that Enoch and Elias are going to come again, that wasn't the, um, it wasn't universally believed. It was just, it was, um, it was a popular belief. It, I mean, most people, most commentaries and saints believe that, but not universally. So, let me read here from the Fundamentals of Catholic Dogma, which is a very quoted um, traditional Catholic source of, of doctrine and dogma, from Ludwig, Ludwig von Ott. And, and he indicates that um, Elias will not come literally before the end of the world. He states this, he states that Jesus does not speak of a future coming of Elias before the general judgment, not even in the Gospel of St. Matthew, um, chapter 17. And then St. Cyprian expounds, this is from the Catholic Haydock Bible Commentary, he expounds it of two sorts of martyrs, the two, the two witnesses. He says they could be um, martyrs of the Catholic faith, to wit, they who suffer death, which is one witness, and others who only suffer imprisonment or loss of goods and the like, so second witness. Others expounded of the testimonies concerning Christ and his church, or which some are in the Old Testament and some in the New. So so even some commentaries, I don't know who they are, but the, the Catholic Haydock Bible indicates they exist, that... Um, the two witnesses could be a metaphorical concept. It could be the Old and New Testaments or things like that. So um, that's important. All right. Now, jumping again to the encyclical by Pope Pius XII, Meteotor Dei, he talks about the faith in a liturgy. Okay. In his encyclical, he wrote, The entire liturgy, therefore, has the Catholic faith as its content, insomuch as it bears public witness to the faith of the Church. So the concepts of faith liturgy and witness are tied together by Pope Pius XII. Um, he also gives that maxim 
that Latin maxim, lex arendi, lex credendi, which means the law of prayer is the law of faith. So what I'm saying there is that faith and liturgy are tied together as almost like one unit, right? So um, uh, this, this is true. We can see this in, in a negative uh, proof by the fact that Novus Ordo changed the liturgy and the consequence was a change of faith as well. It changed the beliefs of the people because the liturgy was changed. Because lex arendi, lex credendi, how you pray is how you believe. They affect each other. So this, I'm trying to show that the faith and liturgy are a unit of two, but they also go together. They're always together, right? Like two witnesses. <laughs> okay, now let's see here. Um, now a little bit of history. Um, so in 1870s, I'm going to explain why February 11th, 19, uh, 1929, the Lateran Treaty is so important as a starting point for the two witnesses testifying. Um, in 1870, the Freemasons took control of the Papal States by force, and the Freemasons then, um, under King Victor Emmanuel II, the new Fre Freemasonic King of Italy, they suppressed and softly persecuted Catholicism, or you could say, like, in a, in a, they didn't kill anybody per se, but they put pressure on the church. They they um, made it follow all these legal rules. They they, they um, suppressed um, public uh, veneration and you know, they always made it hard. Like St. John Bosco is a good example of what was happening in that time period. Um, he always was getting in trouble with the state or you know he had to do things secretly or follow these silly rules. Um, but then in 1929, February 11th, Mussolini signs the Lateran Treaty, which kind of flips the script. It makes Catholicism the state religion of Italy. And it actually... Um, it, it, it gives power, not power, it gives, it gives public support, I guess, for the faith um, in, in the church. So now, this starts a time of the prophecy of the two witnesses. Remember, they prophesied for 1,260 days. And it has to be in the context of that, that one-week period, the final week, or the period of the seven kings. Recall that the Lateran Treaty starts the period of the seven kings. It's also starting, what I'm claiming here, it's also starting the time of the prophecy of the two witnesses. Now, there's a clear distinction between um, before the Lateran Treaty and after. So these two witnesses prophesize the faith and liturgy. They prophesize for half of that final week until they're killed by the beast that comes out of the abyss. And what kills them? The Novus Ordo, right? The Novus Ordo changes the liturgy and alters the faith, thereby killing the two witnesses. Now, moving on to the next part, it says that the... Um, they lie, they lie dead in the streets of the great city. So the great city is often thought to be Jerusalem, which is true, but the parallel for Jerusalem in our time is, is, is Rome. Um, Jerusalem was the center of the Old Testament um, religion, and Rome is the center of Catholicism. Uh, we have the high priest, the Pope. He is in Rome, and the high priest in the Old Testament was in Jerusalem. You can see very clearly that Rome is the new Jerusalem in our time. So it's also the great city um, in many other ways. It's very clearly, very, I don't really have to explain why it's a great city. But the two witnesses lie dead in the streets of the great city for three and a half days, it says, and they come back to life again. Now, this is neat because if the Novus Ordo killed the two witnesses in 1971, um, specifically November 28, 1971, that's the date that Paul VI universally mandated the Novus Ordo and he totally restricted the Tridentine Mass. That was the, the cutoff date. Um, Three and a half years, exa exactly, from that point. So if you go ahead three years, you're going to get um, November 28th, 1974, and then go another half year, and you come to May, 20, May 25th, 26th, 1975. That's three and a half years. <laughs> that's the day. That's the day when the Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre uh, and the SSPX in 1975, they brought a bunch of seminarians and priests and faithful to Rome for the Jubilee year of 1975 for what's called the Credo Pilgrimage. So for the first time in three and a half years, you have the Catholic faith being uh, preached in the streets of the great city and the Trinity Mass was being said again all over the city of Rome. Because there was, like, I think, I, I read, I, I'll link in my, somewhere, I'll link that um, over a hundred Masses were sung by, their, by his priests um, during that uh, two-day two -day period. In all the basilicas of Rome, so St. Paul outside the wall, St. Lawrence um, Basilica, St. Peter's probably not, but maybe, I don't think so, but all uh, the Basilica of St. Uh, Maxentius and all kinds of minor churches all over the place, um, Trinity Masses were being said. And it happened three and a half years after the Novus Ordo killed the faith and liturgy in Rome. So clearly, there's the two witnesses coming back to life again. It says also that the, the, the people of the earth, or the, the men of the earth, or the kings of the earth, they were happy, they rejoiced 
over the death of the two witnesses. And that's what we saw. We saw the modernists were so happy they finally killed the mass and the faith. So they fought. And they were giving gifts to each other. Probably what's probably what happened. They were probably having parties after they pulled it off. But then they were filled with dread, seeing the faith and the liturgy come back to Rome again, thinking that they were dead. And here they were, right before their eyes, um, again, in the streets of the great city. In the streets of the great city. So that's just phenomenal. Now, going back to my very first segment about Moses and Elias um, and um, linking, linking them with the faith and liturgy way back at the Council of Trent. Well, here we are again. I'm, I'm making the same claim is that Moses and Elias in the gospel accounts represented the, um, the Catholic Restoration um, and the Council of Trent where the faith and the liturgy were clarified and, and made more radiant and, and, and resplendent during that time. And those two concepts of faith and liturgy are back again now in the apocalyptic text about the two witnesses. Um, so there, and there we are. And it's, we even have commentary saying that some saints thought that the two witnesses would be Moses and Elias, the two prophets that were on Mount Tabor with our Lord. Um, so, well, I think I said a mouthful. Um, I probably missed some things, but whatever, I'm already way past my time. So I know this is a long video, but um, hopefully it was worth your time. And don't forget to email me with any questions you have, and I'll address them in the next episode. All right. Ave Maria, and God bless you. And glory be to God.